happy Leap Day. We are living on bonus time, so I wanted to talk about a little bonus space uh, within DNS. <sighs> Let's start by talking about what DNS is. It is the domain name system. Uh, people like to use the phone book metaphor to explain DNS. Uh, it makes sense because it's immediately understandable by a lot of people, though I suspect less and less as time goes on. <laughs> The full picture of it, if you're really going with the metaphor, though, is more complicated. Like Mario 3 Level 8 complicated. <laughs> Got it. So let's go back over that. You start by typing a URL in your browser and hitting Enter. You move further onto the map with the recursive resolver. Often it's provided by your ISP, but you might opt to use something else, like Google's Quad 8. Your nearby resolver will also have some DNS information cached. If, that, if it doesn't find your record there, it will start the greater journey onto the map. First, we'll move to the root server, which will check the URL being queried and figure out what top-level domain server to send your query to. At this point, it's more of a short list that says root at the top rather than a full-on thick phone book. Then you hop to the TLD server, which lo looks at your .horse domain, and it finds the name server that holds the specific record you're seeking. So next is the name server, which tells you what IP you can find your extremely important domain at. Then your well-traveled query returns to you, asserting that endless.horse is at 104.236.181.76. At last, <laughs> your princess is not in another castle. <laughs> Big dynamic DNS as we know it replaced the old convention of static hosts.txt files, which were closer to the literal, the literal definition of a phone book. They were maintained by the Stanford Research Institute for the ARPANET membership. These static files were periodically updated and sent out weekly-ish or retrieved or replaced as needed. DNS was described in 1983 and started to be implemented in 1984, which exchanged this uh, file that ex explained the small proto-internet for lots and lots of individual queries. So the internet could scale more gracefully and people wouldn't be stymied by stale host.txt files. Host.txt gave way to Etsy hosts, uh, which is on your computer now and by default includes things like your preferred IP for localhost, but you can edit them to override what you might get via DNS too. It's handy for local networks or if maybe you're a little distractible and want to redirect twitter.com to something more related to your job. <laughs> but let's have a moment of obligatory zen because we're talking about <laughs> DNS. <laughs> The great and terrible thing about DNS is that so many things rely on it. So if DNS is having a bad day, a much reused recursive DNS server is down, for instance, it can ruin a lot of things. That means, though, that it can also be used to do all kinds of interesting stuff. For instance, there's one kind of server attack that involves many, many sources making DNS queries and spoofing the source IP, so all of those queries go back to one source and can possibly take it out, just because you wanted to, use to get the IP for a URL. There are 10 DNS record types. Um, the one that you will see if you use dig in your terminal with no flags is a record, which returns the IPv4 address for a URL. But we are here to talk about only one, text records. <laughs> they can have basically anything in them. They are constrained by length, and you are restricted to the printable set of ASCII characters. That's the original 128. Emoji, alas, a write out. <laughs> Beyond that, I quote from RFC 1035. The semantics of the text depends on do the domain where it is found. <laughs> I know that feel. Um, these are the grab bag of DNS, and that is why I love them. RFC 1464 presents the idea of a key value format, which is pretty often what you're going to find when you look these up, but they're not required. Like so many internet standards, it's just an optional format that's become normal, but you can do what you want with them. Some common ones you're likely to see if you dig a domain's text records include uh, domain ownership, verification for different services, uh, marketing things, web hosting things. It's also where you're going to see DKIM and DMARC and SPF for encrypted emails and spam handling, stuff like that. The most creative, still generally on brand use that I saw, uh, I read about a university that put Latin long in the text records for their servers so that they could more quickly figure out where the server lived on their sprawling campus. <laughs> There's also this one. Let's see how fuzzy this is. That's a bit small. All right, so it's a dig text for dns.google. You have an SPF record, but there's also an XKCD URL. <laughs> A 
because someone at Google got cute. <laughs> so maybe you're with me and you're already envisioning some of the weird stuff you can get up to with this. I want to tell you about a few more. Uh, the classic one, DNS tunneling. It's a bit more than 20 years old, so far as we can officially tell. It was presented at Black Hat in 2004 by Dan Kaminsky, who, uh, if you like DNS shenanigans, he's an excellent Google. There are a few ways to do this, but the central part is always smuggling something that's not supposed to be there in a DNS query packet. Um, they're not monitored a lot of the time in the same way as regular HTTP traffic. And that permissiveness of their movement makes it a great vector for exfiltrating data or getting malware into places that otherwise it would be much harder to get to. With this method, uh, data is sometimes smuggled via non-existent subdomains in the URLs the packet appears to be querying for, just long rando string .com, that kind of thing. But if your packet is designed to return, say, a nice chunk of text records, you can really stuff some information or code in there. DNS queries, they smuggle stuff and evade firewalls. Awesome. Then there is sidestepping internet censorship. The most common way of doing this involves uh, sidestepping government, usually government, DNS poisoning by setting your resolver to quad eight. Um, this is getting less useful as more sophisticated technology is put to monitoring and controlling the tech we all rely on. However, there is another way, uh, like David Ledbeater's 2008 project, which put truncated Wikipedia articles in text records, like this one. So sadly, they're not up anymore, but there's no reason that we can't exploit what David referred to as basically a huge associative array for great good, right? <laughs> then there's this one, DNSFS. <laughs> so a British programmer named Ben Cox found DNS resolvers that were open to uh, the public internet and used text records to cache a blog post on servers all around the world. He used 250 character base 64 strings that came out to about 187 bytes each uh, to accomplish this, and he worked out that the caches would be valid for at least a day. Uh, this is probably my favorite. He, uh, I link to uh, the post in the blog post about this. He has an animation of proof of concept, and I actually yelled in my apartment when I saw it. <laughs> it is glorious. So naturally, I wanted to play. I found some interesting things when I was experimenting for this presentation, and there's stuff I still want to dig into. Um, different providers handle uncommon numbers of DNS text records differently. I found this just working with DreamHost and AWS. DreamHost has kind of a clunky web UI for it. Um, they also have an API that I didn't get to use yet. They are content to let you make tons of text records. Uh, I topped out at 50. AWS, meanwhile, will let you make a single one per domain or subdomain, um, but still has some of those limits, the 250 if you have characters, the length, that kind of thing. Adding a ton of these records does seem to cause some delays on DNS propagation. When I was experimenting with it, I was finding stale things fully an hour later after clearing cache and resetting things. Like, yeah, I had the unique pleasure of constipating the internet. <laughs> um, although honestly, vanilla DNS is enough to be responsible for all of that, minus adding 50 records to a single domain. So I toyed with lots of ideas, but I made what I hope is an unsticking tool for when you're trying to think through something. So it's connected to maybe this could dot work. There are subdomains from zero to 50, and each one includes a little message that I'm hoping will get you to rethink things if you're trying to finish a thought or a project or a writing thing, just to change your perspective or alter your reality a little bit so that maybe you can keep moving forward. Uh, I wanted it to be zero to 49, but DreamHost, for reasons I don't know yet, does not let you do a subdomain that's just a zero. It just blanks it out. It allowed double zero, though, so mm. um, So you can go and start doing some digging and find all of them, or they're all in a gist that's linked in my blog post for this. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.